10 o'clock. If you want to grab your Bibles, if you have them, we're going to read 1 Chronicles chapter 29, a few verses. So while you find that, 1 Chronicles chapter 29. Good morning to you. And uh, I hope you like the cool mornings and the hot days. If you don't, you haven't traveled anywhere recently. <laughs> Especially the south. Did you enjoy the hurricane last week? No, you didn't, because you live in the central Washington, and there's no hurricanes here. Hallelujah. There's something kind of neat about hurricane parties. You get together, no power for three days. As long as your house is standing when you go back. <laughs> First Chronicles, chapter 29, we'll pick it up in verse 10. If you're able, if you want to stand with me in honor of the word of God, and the God of the Word, First Chronicles chapter 29. David has kind of got things together for the temple, but he doesn't get to build the temple for various reasons, and his son Solomon will build it, which is Second Chronicles. But we're going to read David's praise in First Chronicles chapter 29, verse 10. David blesses the congregation. David blessed the Lord before all the congregation. And this wonderful man of God, David, said, Blessed are you, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever, yours, Yahweh, the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, the majesty, and all that is in heaven and earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Yahweh, or Jehovah, and you are exalted as head over all, both riches and honor come from you, and you reign over all. In your hand is power, might. In your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. Now, therefore, our God, we thank you and do what? Father, we come here this morning. I trust our motives are to do nothing but to praise and to honor and to glory in you, the glorious one. So, Father, may we raise our hands, and may we bend our knees, and may we weep over sin, may we rejoice in forgiveness, and may we just stand in awe of the incredible privilege it is to be able to enter in, access with boldness and confidence into the very presence of the creator of the ends of the earth, who holds all things, knows all things, gives life to all things, is outside of time and space, and yet the Bible has the audacity to declare, knows every hair upon your head, knit you together in your mother's womb. No one like you, and no one is worthy of worship but you. trading my sorrows I'm trading my shame I'm laying them down for the joy of the Struck down, but 
struck wonder at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power.
us to be more thirsty for you, Lord. That we wouldn't forget that the water we drink from the well will never truly quench our thirst, Lord. But that if we are drinking from the living water, from your word, from you, Lord, that we will never thirst again. Father, please help us in all the times of desperation that seem to be consuming our lives. Where the enemy is fully against us, Lord. That you would help us to just drink from you. That we would feed from your word, Lord. That we would not forget that we are not alone. Lord, I pray that you would just continue to give us strength. That we would never forget that your mercies are new every morning and that your love never fails. So I pray that you would bless your word, Lord. That you would speak it to us. That you would continue to use Tom and this desire to just Preach your love and your word, Lord. That you would allow it to just take over our lives. And that we wouldn't be consumed by everything else. So we thank you for loving us. We thank you for this church. For these people we call family and friends, Lord. That we are all here for you and to support each other. As we continue to strive on in this world until you call us home, Lord. We love you give all these things over to you and in your name. Amen. God is good. All right. I don't know about you, but Sunday mornings are really wonderful because I don't have any pipes to change and yards to mow and dogs are already fed and I don't know about you, but I have a few chores to do around the house. Maybe not as many as you, but a few. So it's nice to be here and away from all that. But more importantly, it's enjoyable to be with you guys. Uh, isn't it cool to worship the Lord together? There's just something nice about it. Maybe it's just me. Grab your Bibles. Revelation chapter 4. We'll pick it up in verse 1. Like they did in the days of Nehemiah, the people stood in honor and awe of God himself. And so if you would join me in standing, if you're able, we're in Revelation chapter 4. We just continue verse by verse through the book of Revelation. And it's been a little while since we've been here due to visits to the south to bury a pious father and um, all of that. So I think it's been three weeks at least since we're here. So now we're back. It was a good place to break. God knows what he's doing. We finished on the church age, and so I trust you have got to Revelation chapter 4. We pick it up in verse 1. Hold on to your seats. After these things, meditato, after these things, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one set on the throne. And he who sat there was like, please note the word like, like a jasper and a sardis stone in appearance. There was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Around the throne, 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and back, and the first living creature was like a lion, second living creature like a calf, 
third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, full of eyes all around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Please note the exclamation point. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever, cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Flip over to Isaiah chapter 6, and we'll just read one more place, Isaiah, Let's see, I think it's after the Psalms, one of the big guys, Isaiah chapter 6, Psalm, Proverbs, yep, and then Isaiah, Lamentations, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, so Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah lives around 8th century A B.C., and in Isaiah chapter 6, this gentleman named Uzziah, he was king, and he passes away. And then Isaiah has an encounter with Yahweh. Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lifted up, and the train, or what goes behind him, of his robe filled the temple, heavenly temple. Above it stood seraphim, those are angels, each had six wings, with two he covered his face, two he covered his feet, with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. The posts of the doors were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. And then I said, I am undone. Mm. Well. Lord, it's a little shocking that you would be kind enough to us to let us kind of glimpse like Jasper and like Sardis and like Sapphire and like Emerald that were in a sense just left speechless to these things. Like the song says, my imagination is really all I have, do I? dance mm. maybe I just fall but hopefully like the little children I just get to sit in your lap Father no one's like you understatement of the day thank you for you mm. Help us now in these things, and we ask it in Jesus' name. God's people know what to do and what to say. Amen. All right, Lord bless you guys. You know you can sit. Good morning to you. If you haven't been here before, we're just going through Revelation. Glad you're here. God rules. You're here by the kindness and grace of Almighty. So we're in the book of Revelation this morning, and... I'm not sure the best time to say this, so I guess I'll just say it now. Just kind of family business, if you would. Um, I was pondering this week, just walking in circles around these chairs. I do that more than you know, and it's kind of the best place to study at times. And uh, called my pastor, talked to him about it, make sure I'm not going crazy. That's already happened, so I try not to do it a second time. Right. And uh, I was like, you know, I know pretty much just about all of you in here individually, and some of you very well. And you just need to know, due to my calling, not occupation, I wish it was an occupation, then you can quit. <laughs> tried doesn't work so you just deal with it um, our friendship is secondary 
to your salvation and then your sanctification. Okay? Because of the heaviness, I'll repeat it. <laughs> My friendship with you personally is secondary to your salvation and your sanctification primarily. That's why if you talk to pastors, they'll tell you ministry is lonely. Well, not really, because if you all leave me, and that includes those closest to me, I am greatly grieved, and I'll weep bitterly, but I lose nothing I hold dear, because Jesus is enough. And hopefully you'll eventually get there someday, because you should say the same thing I say. If I offend your flesh and your sinful nature, you should eventually thank me. If I offend the Holy Spirit, you should take it to the Lord privately, and then you should call me privately and sit down with me privately to discuss these things, because I have clay feet just like you. Do not be afraid to say something to me because of my position, because you're afraid to offend me. If that's the case, then I'm in the wrong and you're in the wrong. So my friendship with you, secondary to your salvation and your sanctification. If you have any questions, you know my phone number. So we're in Revelation chapter 4. Oh, and I wanted to say, i got to say this because this is just by humor. Sandy Adams, he's the pastor of the Calvary in Atlanta. He's one of the um, kind of older guard guys, and he's just top-notch. And uh, we went to Georgia, so I got to talk to a couple of Calvary guys there. And uh, this guy, Nick, um, he's Calvary Savannah. And by the way, this hasn't started my sermon time, just so you know. <laughs> huh. um, but Sandy Adams, he has this, a pastor's conference, right? Just like, he, he just does so well. And he, a new guy's planting a Calvary, or he's taking over a Calvary. And he brings them up front of everybody. And he gives them, uh, like, at least three things. First thing he gives them, and like I would bring you up here in front of all these other pastors who've been doing the ministry for a while, and he says, I got a few things for you, and the guy's just, he's disarming with his humor, he's just, just wonderful, and he gives them a bucket with a towel, and this is for, maybe you know, washing feet, right, because you're to serve. And then the second thing he gives them is he gives them some aspirin, because of all the headaches that he's going to have in the ministry, and then the third thing that he gives them is bandages for all the stab wounds in his back from friends. And that's when the place erupts and laughs because they've already been there and you just haven't earned your scars yet. <laughs> and so once you do pastoral ministry, you know, give it a decade and you're like, oh yeah. So I met with a pastor, he's from Highland. His name is James Kelpert, wonderful guy. He just, he's just sweet, he's wonderful. And he's been doing this pastor thing, senior pastor thing, for a year. And like, just steadfast. You just need to earn some scars. And then once you do, then you can eventually say what I just said. Just takes a little time. Just continue at it. And so those of you that know me, I trust you know where I'm coming from. And you may hopefully feel the same way. That you're okay losing me as a friend... Because if I do something sideways and you call me out on it and I reject it, then you should take more immediate action because I, like you, have clay feet and am prone to being proud. And that's where you all should do this. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, God resists the proud. Okay, now we'll start. So Revelation chapter 4 if you want a title, I'm going to use the idea of a courtroom, and I'm going to title this message, Called to the Stand, or Would You Please Call Your Next Witness? Things to note just in Revelation chapter 4, if you think we're covering all of this in depth, you have lost your mind and weren't paying attention. Uh, this is the third time in a row he's mentioned doors, so God's very much into doors. The church at Philadelphia, open door. The church at Laodicea, I'm knocking on the door, let me in. And then he opens the door into the eternals. And what's cool, there's a door, God opens it, and then God speaks. Or if you want to have some fun, there's an invitation, and then there is a presentation of things. Come, 
I will show you things to come to pass. That's just basically verse 1 and verse 2. Aren't you thankful that God invites you in? Um, I don't know if you know this yet. I just discovered it yesterday that uh, the Mormons are now sending their little disciples into Walmart parking lots. I don't know if you've seen this yet. So my wife's like, we need to go get a few things. I'm like, let's go to Walmart in Yakima because I like adventure. <laughs> so I just get my knife and I get my pistol because I have a concealed weapons permit and I can do those things legally. And so I'm like, here we go. <laughs> let's do this. And so we go to the Walmart in Yakima. No, it will definitely Terrace Heights. There's only one. And there's one in West Valley, but eh, it's West Valley. So I go to the one in Yakima. All right. West Valley's like, you know, Samaritans. We don't go out there. <laughs> Tongue in cheek. I hope you understand my humor. I'm from Sela, West Valley. Okay. For you, those of you from West Valley, there's grace for you. <laughs> so we go down there and we do our thing. We get whatever. And we and I look and I see these two kids and you know they wear their shirts. They got their name tags. Like okay. And I'm like oh interesting. They're just kind of like pushing carts. Like oh that's very admirable. And. Then we come out, and I'm like, okay, Lord, just available. I don't need to hunt these guys down. God's well-equipped if he wants me to talk to anybody. So I'm just doing my thing. Right? Just available, Lord, for whatever. Who am I? So we go to our car. We put our groceries away. And then I just kind of forget about it. Like, look, and I turn around, and there he is. <laughs> I'm like, hey, can I take your cart? I was like, you sure can. What are you doing? I'm just curious. I don't know of your motives. You know, what are you doing? And he says, well, we're just inviting people to church. Like, why would you do that? I'm like, well, um, eh, um, and so I just have a, a, a leading question. And I, it's the sixth question of the six questions and how to serve Jesus without fear. I used 20 years ago, so I skipped the first five. Who's got time for that? <laughs> My wife's in the car. I've got stuff melting, right? Who's got time for s these things? I ain't got time to read a book. I'll just take the last question. If what you believed was not true, would you want to know it? Then I just wait. And this kid just looks at me, uh, and he's like, I think so. Well, Jesus said to Pilate about truth, and Jesus the way. So are you really a seeker of truth? And I got him for about a minute. Lord bless you, young man. This is who I am. This is where I'm at. My wife's in the car. It's time for me to go. Goodbye. And there it is. Open doors. Here's God's invitation. Come. I don't need to get you in. God will get you in. And God brought you here. And I told him that. God brought you here at this time in this place for this purpose for this two minutes. Are you ready? He's probably during headlights. Doesn't matter to me. He got the gospel. We move on with life. Because God desires not only to be known, but God desires to have intimate, deep, personal fellowship with you, closer than a brother, more near than your spouse. And God has gone to incredible extremes to make this happen. Because man severs relationship, go read Genesis 3, and God goes to extreme measures to reestablish relationship, and it's called Calvary, and it's called blood, because God wore sandals, and God wore a crown of thorns for you. So don't tell me that God didn't go to extreme measures before time began to redeem you personally. Yeah, he holds the universe in the span of his hand, and the universe increases, and God's already there, but he knows the hair upon your face. He knows how many toes you got. He knows when you clip your toenails. He knows your thoughts from afar. Go read Psalm 139 if you haven't lately. So the outline of Revelation, we covered it. It's verse 19 of chapter 1. See, I'm in your presence. The things that then are, which is the church age, which he covers in chapters 2 and 3. And then he says, after these things. And the Greek word is metatauto. It means after what things? It means after the church age. And so this is the church age. And now you get this glimpse. Like the curtain just kind of opens a little, and you get this glimpse in chapters 4 and 5 into the heavenlies, and then the things that are about to take place. And that's what he says, right? Open door in heaven, the things that must take place after this. After what? After the church is harpazoed, or the church is raptured, that we're not under the wrath of God. Jesus took the wrath of God upon us. The, 
whole great tribulation is God's wrath poured out upon rebellious and sinful men, and that is not me, and I trust that's not you. And so, Lord, come quickly. And so, after these things, but before that, you have this whole section. It's really strange, this whole pastor thing. I'm literally sitting in the, sitting in the seat thinking, Lord, when do I share this thing about friendship? I'm not sure, so I already did it to you. And if I would have just looked in my notes, it's right here. This is when I was supposed to do it. <laughs> you want scripture references, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul says, I'm jealous for you, church, with godly jealousy, because I fear lest somehow, and that's just somehow, enemy's got all kinds of tactics, and he's looking for any chink in the wall, whatever it might be. Maybe you're looking for satisfaction in money. Maybe it's in relationships. Maybe you're looking for satisfaction in things. And all those roads lead to dead ends. And hopefully eventually you come to the place and you say, Lord, my soul is restless until it finds its rest in you. And like Zach Williams sings, a hundred highways I went down and didn't find you. And then there you were. Oh, there he is. That somehow, lest the serpent deceive you like he deceived Eve from the what? simplicity that's in Jesus. Simplicity. And then Paul says in the end of Colossians chapter 1, Christ in you, the hope of glory, warning every man and teaching every man that, I pre that Paul says, I want to present every single person I come in contact with perfect before Christ. I labor for the striving, and he works in me to give me the power to do so. So I hope that you're about perfecting one another, and that means conforming to the image of Jesus. And so this whole section, the first time I read it this week, the first word that hit me is the word beauty, and that's where we live today. Three things hit me. You only get one. you got to stay tuned in for the next two, the next two weeks. Yeah, I know. <laughs> beauty. The Apostle John who walked near with the Lord Jesus Christ on his earthly children more than maybe anybody else, head on his bosom, he was at the crucifixion, he's lived the longest, he gets a glimpse into the eternals and he writes it down for us. And so he's trying his best to describe the indescribable. And the word is just simply beauty. There's a throne of glory, there's brightness, there's lightnings, there's thunderings, there's voices, there's stones like jasper, mostly red, sardis, Mostly a reddish, orangish, yellow. Sapphire is mostly blue. I should have mentioned, I'm sorry, cross-reference Ezekiel chapter 1. You can read it on your own later. Revelation 4, Isaiah 6, Ezekiel chapter 1 gives you a glimpse into the Eternals and these creatures. And note all those different kind of stones. They have varieties of color. They're not just red. If you go look them up, there's like this wonderful variety. And so Paul's like, or John's like, I'm doing my best. It's like Jasper, and it's like Sardis. Uh, trying to describe, I don't know if you've looked at certain things lately, like the Hubble telescope. Oh, what is that? Right, it's just, it's just trying, and the, there's a rainbow. Oh, I'm familiar with rainbows because I get to see them after, after rains. Emerald, mostly green, right? And a rainbow is a symbol of mercy. It's a symbol of reassurance. It's a symbol of God's promise being kept, and there's seven colors to the rainbow. In case you didn't know, there's not six. That's not a rainbow. It's called Roy G. Bibb. Red, orange, yellow, green, Bibb. Blue, indigo, violet. That's for my wife to you. Roy G. Bibb, that's how she remembers. Seven colors, because seven is the number of perfection. The pride flag has six colors, because that's the number of man are falling short. Hmm. And it's called pride. But nonetheless, we move on. Sea glass is light, crystal, peaceful. The appearance of this throne and all that is going on, it's beautiful. And the beauty of what he sees, please catch this, is a reflection of his character. What he sees in the eternals is just simply a glimmer and a reflection of the very character that the outside matches the inside of God perfectly. God is beautiful. And as John sees this, he's just immediately struck by 
the beauty of God. And if you read chapter 1, there's some similarities. He just falls down as though he's dead. Jesus, right hand, don't be afraid, comfort. And so this morning we will call three witnesses to the stand. We could call an infinite number of witnesses. But three have come to my mind. And the first witness that we call to the stand about the beauty of the triune Godhead is the easiest one. And we start in chronological order, and it's called creation. The first witness is creation, and though creation is corrupted by the fall, as you well know, at times, absolutely stunning. Right? In a boat, on a river, watching the sunset, and then there's no wind, and the water's just crystal clear, and you think maybe like I think, Lord, please stop, time, Joshua this thing. The, the colors... Right, and sunset. I remember I was in Cuba, and I watched the sunset, and it looked like a basketball being dropped through a hoop. I couldn't believe it. I was like, the sun literally just fell out of the sky because you're right by the equator. And I just, it was just one time. I'm in the water. I'm just kind of snorkeling. Probably shouldn't have been. But anyways, I was, and the water's just crystal clear in the Caribbean. And I just watched the sun. It just, it just goes, zhoo. Like, oh, I'm literally just shock and awe of the whole thing. Right? Maybe you've been to the ocean. You should go to the ocean at least once a year and just sit on the, in the sand, tickle your feet in the sand, and just look and listen and just stand in awe of creation. Hubble's telescope, look at a few pictures. Just, I, don't, I don't know what to say about it. Right? Tonight, go out and just look at the stars. Like, oh, yeah, that's right. They're still in the same spot they were when God spoke less than 10,000 years ago. That's quite remarkable. Oh, there's the North Star. It's still there. I could sail across the ocean by just watching the North Star. Oh, well, must have been intentional. I don't know if you, what kind of TV apparatus you have. We have this Apple TV thing. And when it goes on sleep mode, it just gives pictures. Like, really cool pictures, like from outer space. And like, you're like, wow, I didn't know that existed in China. Absolutely just stunning and gorgeous. And if you need a cross-reference, you can go read Psalm 19 on your own. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows its handiwork. Night unto night, creation speaks. I'm going to shoot from the hip here and try to remember the great apologist, Ravi Zacharias, who was accused of various things that were probably false. But nonetheless, he gives us this whole process of awe and wonder. And he starts from infancy. And he works up to maturity. And it's quite wonderful, and you've been around kids, maybe you've been around grandkids, and it's really wonderful. You kind of raise kids or been around kids, and they grow up, and then all of a sudden, like, I'm still the same age in my mind of 30, but nonetheless, people around me keep aging. <laughs> and we've got this little grandchild, and he thinks it's hilarious when his dad coughs. He, my son coughs, and the kid, I'm like, what? <laughs> They're just in awe of just the simplest things. Then as they kind of grow up, and you guys know, you've been around them, like when they're like two or three, like you pull in the driveway, and you know, grandma's coming to visit, or the aunt's coming over, or dad's home, and they like beat feet to the door, and like if you've got a popsicle, hero. They're like Superman, right? Anybody relate? Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, oh yeah, that's right, when they were two or three, they did it, and then they get a little older, and then as they get older, you need to kind of have like a milkshake, because the popsicle just doesn't do it anymore. And then when they get certain ages, popsicles and milkshakes don't do it. You need, like, car keys. <laughs> I'm like, oh, they're car keys. Look at this. All right, and then after car keys, then it's just kind of wallets and such. And then we get to maturity, and none of it leaves us in awe. There's only one thing that leaves man in awe his entire life, and that is him who creates all things. My wife shows up with a sucker, very nice. You come to my house with $1,000, it's fine and good, it'll go to bills. But I look at creation rising in the east, and I literally just sit there and just awe and wonder. Another day that God has given us, and the sun sets, and it's just a glimmer and reflection of the grandeur and the beauty of God. There's a song, you've probably heard it, Mercy Me does it. We've done it. It's called Love of God. And he says, Could we with ink, and right, ink, the ocean fill? So the ocean is now ink. 
and were the skies of parchment made. So the skies are canvas. Were every stalk on earth a quill. So every stalk of grain and every stalk of corn is now turned into a writing utensil. If every stalk on earth a quill and every man a scribe. So the eight plus billion people living right now are now all scribes grabbing all the stalks, dipping their pen in the ocean, writing upon the skies. That's the word picture that this gentleman developed. To write the love of God above would drain the oceans dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. And then you just simply say, agreed. The universe is 13.5 billion light years across. So what are they doing? Guessing. That's all they're doing. You know how long it takes to get around the world? One light year. Right? One second, seven times around the world. One second. Seven times around the world. That's a light year. Empty space, it's even faster. 300,000 miles per second. So we think. And God's like, oh, it's, just, it's just right here. I just, hold on. No biggie. Creation. Right? I don't know if you've read the last verse of the Gospel of John lately, but John says, not sure what else to say. If all the books and all the world were written, not even... All the things that Jesus did and said, if all the book couldn't contain them. So I've just given you a couple of things to the best of my ability as empowered by the Holy Spirit. Witness number one, thank you for giving your testimony. You may be seated. Witness number two, would you please come forward? And witness number two you find in the book of Lamentations. If you can find it, I'm going to flip there. But um, lucky me, I've got a bookmark some there. <laughs> Lamentations, it follows... Uh, Jeremiah, Jeremiah writes the book of Lamentations. It's before the book of Ezekiel. And while you are looking for it, the historical setting is simply God has for centuries given and given and called and forgiven these individuals that we know as Israelites. Lamentations chapter 3 verse 22 is where you're going. If you read Romans 9, it says that God gave the nation the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the law, the service, or the tabernacle, the promises, and the Messiah were all given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Jacob's sons, and the Messiah came through the line of Judah. Gave them all those things. And what do the nation of Israel and what do God's people do? They spit in his face. They turn their back on them, and they go worship other gods that aren't gods but demons, and they reject Yahweh for Baal, and they do it for centuries. And God sends prophets, and they kill the prophets. And God sends more prophets to the priests, and the priests turn their back and shut the doors. And after many tears and much blood and many warnings and the long suffering of God, enough is enough. You're going to go into captivity. And they're going to decimate your houses. They're going to haul off your families. And you think Nazi Germany was bad. This was real bad. And the worst is still yet to come. In the midst of that, and you can read Lamentations chapter 1, 1. How lonely sits the city that was full of people. Just come and just bulldoze Sila, And then leave for a while and come back and go, oh, wow, I used to live there, and now, oh my, why? Because I rejected the kindness and goodness of God. And in the midst of that, God actually says, and I have to read it, and it's in the Bible to believe it, Lamentations chapter 3, 22. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions fail never they are new how often oh thankful for that great is your faithfulness and so hopefully you can say the lord is my portion says my soul therefore i hope in him and god says 70 years because you profane me for 490 years and you owe me a year for every seven years and so for 490 years you've done this so you owe me 70 and they do 70, and then God moves and brings them back. Why? Because, not because of their goodness, but because his mercies are not consumed, because his compassions fell not, because he made a promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and that's their land. 
and then the dispersion, and guess who's back in the promised land? The Jewish people. Because of Jeremiah chapter 3, or Lamentations 3, 22, it's just a glimpse into it. Witness number 2, Jeremiah, weeping. It's called Lamentations for a reason. In the midst of the weeping of man's sinfulness, God's like, yet I'm still merciful. Thank you, Jeremiah. You may sit down. The third person to take the stand we find in John chapter 8. In John chapter 8, some Bibles want to take this section out probably because it's so glorious and profound and so shame on them for doing so. John chapter 8, in verse 1, Jesus is speaking. He's on the Temple Mount. The whole Temple Mount is this huge area of I think it's 10 to 12, 15 acres, and right there is the temple. It's glorious. It's huge. It's marvelous. Built by Herod. Took him almost 50 years. And there's Jesus teaching. He goes to bed. He wakes up in the morning, and you see in chapter 7, 53, everyone to his own house. Jesus leaves, goes to Mount of Olives, right, commonplace. Then he comes back the next morning. And so our third witness we call to the stand, her name is Shame, and her last name is Embarrassment. Early in the morning, John chapter 8, verse 2, I trust you're with me. He came again to the temple. All the people came to him. And Jesus sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. We pause. I don't know how much you've thought about this, but this is an organized, strategic event to put Jesus Christ on the spot so that he'd be between a rock and a hard spot. The Romans have taken away capital punishment by the Jews, so the Jews cannot stone anybody legally. And so the Romans have capital punishment. And so she's broken the Old Testament law, but they now want Jesus to be judge, jury, and executioner. It's time to be Dr., what is his name, Judge Dredd, if you would. And so they think they've got him in this pickle because the law says you're supposed to, but Romans law says that you can't. We got this guy. He's busted. Watch this. Who's the guy that agrees to go and and seduce a married woman? I'm going to assume, and I'm making a few liberties here, but I'm going to assume this guy's not married, but he might be, but he's definitely known to the scribes and the Pharisees because where is he? Because only the woman's brought. They're both supposed to be brought. Go read the Levitical law. And so this is an organized event that these religious men, and God forgive religious men organizing sin. These religious men, they are like this whole process is going on, and all of a sudden, in the very act of it, they bust the door open, and they go and they grab her, and him they probably just wink at, And they grab her, and she's probably just trying to find... Can you imagine the shame and the embarrassment that would occur to an individual who is cheating on their spouse, caught in the very act of it by religious men? The Pope and the Cardinals, right? These religious men, right, with their hats, and they kick in the door, and there's like 10 to 15 of them, and it's you. Oh, my goodness gracious, just shoot me on the spot. And who knows what she's trying to grab? Like my clothes are too far. She probably grabs a bed sheet. My mirror, my past and She probably grabs a bed sheet. You're probably right, Tony. Just anything, right, to cover up. And they drag her from the house, through the town, all the way up, and right, and there's the temple. And there's all these people, right? And there's Jesus just sitting and Jesus just teaching. And she's thrown. When they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Hey, teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Oh, my goodness. Moses in the law commanded she should be stoned, but what do you say? And they're probably just like, got him. Got him. Sick of this guy. I'm sick of people following this guy. He's messing with our system. He's messing with our whole program. I am sick and tired of this carpenter's kid from Nazareth causing all these problems and we've got him and the people will no longer follow him because I want them to follow us I need to put more heavy burdens upon their shoulders 
And then this is pretty wise, right? And you can read verse 6, right? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. So the Bible helps you out. Gives you their motives. And then Jesus, and this is difficult, isn't it? Doesn't say a single thing. Just stoops down. Maybe he takes a knee. Maybe he gets on his knees. Maybe he just squats down. And he begins to process the situation. And he begins to talk to Father, help. What shall we say? Fully relying upon the empowerment of the Holy Spirit from his Father and what to say. And sometimes that takes time. He stoops down and he writes on the ground. Who knows what he writes? There's plenty of conjectures. Maybe he starts writing the Ten Commandments. Maybe he starts writing their names. Who knows? As though he did not hear. (laughs) Don't you love it? All these people in the the holiest place on planet Earth, in front of the holiest individual that's ever stepped upon planet Earth, in the most dreaded, sinful, embarrassing moment that you could possibly have in front of the most religious people in the world, and there you are on the ground, probably on your knees with a sheet around you, just weeping and just waiting for stones to hit you. And when he, and when, so when they continue to ask him, right, pestering him, he stands up, and you guys know what he says, he who was without sin, you cast the first stone. Oops. Dagger conscience and then who leaves first the gray hairs because they know better oh that's right and then again he stoops down and he writes on the ground a question and ponder those who heard it being convinced by their conscience went out one by one beginning with the oldest to the kids and jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst and then jesus stood up And saw no one but the woman, and he said, Are you ready to be stoned? Because you deserve it. Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And then the first time she says it, probably trying to wipe away tears and trying to cover herself up from her shame. No one, Lord. Notice the word Lord. Kyrios, master. And Jesus says, Neither do I condemn you. Excuse me? The only one who can says no, and then he says, how about you just go and sin no more? What a wonderful conversation it'll be one day if you get to meet this lady in the eternals. You want to learn about grace. You want to learn about the beauty of Jesus. Go talk to the adulterous woman. We could call more witnesses to the stand, but you probably know some of them. But once again, I read Spurgeon's quote. Jesus is a greater Savior than you think him to be when your thoughts are at their greatest. L-J-C, Lord Jesus Christ, greater, underline, and just put whatever you want in the blank. He's a greater Savior, and I would say, I would add to Spurgeon's quote, Jesus is more beautiful of a Savior than you think him to be than when your thoughts are at their greatest. My Lord is more ready to pardon than you are to sin. He's more able to forgive than you are to transgress. My master is more willing to supply your wants than you are to confess them. He is more ready to forgive than you are to sin. Because I don't know about you, but I fight against sin. And then when it does happen, oh, I just grumbled. He's immediately there to forgive. I'm fighting it. He's always ready. Jesus stands and sits and hangs out in constant intercession for you. He is able to forgive to the uttermost those that come to God, the writer of Hebrews says. He's more ready to pardon than sin, more able to forgive than you are to transgress. When you think you've sinned just too much and he can't, He's forgiven farther. Maybe you're familiar with this ridiculous verse that says, where sin abounds, grace does something. Abounds much more. Excuse me? Who does these things? Right. So 
we simply end with, if you know somebody or something more beautiful than the Lord Jesus Christ, I would ask you to take the stand and declare who that is. If not, we bow in humble adoration to him who is beautiful. What disarms and draws sinners to repentance? Do you not know? Do you despise the riches of his goodness and kindness, not knowing that it's the goodness of God that draws men to repentance? Maybe you know the last verse of Psalm 23. Surely what? Goodness and what? And what does it do? Oh, it follows me. It doesn't lead me. The shepherd leads. Because I don't know about you, but I'm just kind of a dumb sheep. I'm silly. I stumble. I'm skittish. And sometimes I just want to stop and quit. And goodness and mercy, they just come behind me like these gentle sheep dogs. They don't have fangs. They don't bark and holler. They just encourage. Like, no, keep going. The goodness of God is for you. God's merciful. Yeah, you screwed up. God forgives. He's ready, more pardon. He's more ready, more, more ready to forgive than your sin, so just keep going. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and one day, very soon, we shall all dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Father, there's no one more beautiful, more wonderful, that we just stand in awe. I go to oceans and I stand in awe and you but speak it into existence. I think about the depths of the ocean and it just frightens me to no end. And you're there. I look at the heavens and marvel. Go to the top of Chinook Pass and look back at this valley of trees and it's just absolutely stunning in glory and beauty. And it's just but a reflection of how glorious you are. Thank you for the peek behind the curtain. A God who reveals and exposes and condescends and comes to us. And that each one of us would find him more faithful than a BFF, more available than our closest friend, more loving, more glorious than spouse, children, co-workers, that you are the one who is worthy. And then you give us all of these wonderful things to enjoy. You're just beyond explanation. As someone has said, God cannot only just be described he must be experienced that lord where understanding ceases you reaffirm things in our spirit we're thankful for it father we, we take communion very simple the night you were betrayed with your 11 you said gentlemen I'm going to be betrayed this night. This bread is my body. This wine and this juice is my blood. As often as you eat this bread and drink this juice, you proclaim my death until my return. And so, Father, help us to remember you. Do this in remembrance of me. That the second person of the Trinity at the first person of the Trinity's wishes, empowered by the third person of the Trinity, came, conceived, grew in a womb, was then born and grew and lived, and then voluntarily chose of his own volition and obedience to the Father, that he learned obedience by the things that he suffered, that he might draw many sons to glory, and he becomes the captain of our salvation, and his name is the Lord Jesus Christ. And love holds him to the cross, and he spells every drop of blood to redeem us back to himself, to reestablish fellowship between broken, sinful humanity, and gives us the kindness to be able to come together this morning, a free from distractions of phone calls and text messages and calendars, to just sit in solitude and in quietness and to consider the grandeur and the glory of the God that loves you and gave himself for you. And he's worthy of every ounce of your energy and life. And so we do it, Lord, in remembrance of the God who loves us and gave himself for us. Mm.
Lord, you are so wonderful. Help us now to just take a few moments and to meditate on the wonder of Jesus. Amen. Quincy, Pops, you want to come up?